You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Just when you thought the world's most comfortable shoe couldn't get any more comfortable, well, it did. Introducing the Allbirds Wool Runner 2, the next gen version of the legendary shoe that started it all. It's been refined, redesigned, and completely redefined with more than a dozen upgrades. It delivers comfy all-day wear that's built for bliss, turning your cloud nine into a 10. Plus, they're made with sustainability in mind, so you can feel good with each step you take. Added cushioning that delivers a plush ride? Check. An ultra-cozy merino wool upper for a soft fit and feel? Check. Improved durability that offers lasting wear and comfort? Check, check, and check. Lace up a pair and check off next level comfort too. Because when your feet are happy, the rest of you follows. Wherever you're headed, it's easy to keep up the pace when you wear Allbirds. Get yours at Allbirds.com and use code FRESH24 to score a free pair of socks with purchase today. That's a free pair of socks with purchase at allbirds.com, code FRESH24. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 64, The Third Republic, Part 4, Left, 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 Right, Left. This week, a big thank you goes out to Sam, Daryl, and Alex for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special patron-only episodes released once a month. You can find out more at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. On February 6th, 1934, thousands of people were marching in Paris. In what would be the bloodiest political event since the Paris Commune, Various right-wing political groups had decided that it was time to protest the government. The target of these protests was the government under Daladier, which had been supported by a coalition of radical and socialist ministers. In clashes with the police, 14 would be killed, 236 hospitalized, and over 400 injured. They would in turn kill a policeman, hospitalize 92 more, and also injure seven, almost 700. The exact goal of these protests would later be identified by the government inquiry that investigated them as an attempted coup, but there is some doubt that they were quite that organized and ambitious. A true coup would have required a unity of purpose and action from all of the various groups involved, which was not really present. The participants were from a wide range of right-wing groups, from Action Francais to the Croix de Four. And in retrospect, the protests are regarded as a bit more spontaneous and less focused on one goal than, than you would really need for a coup. Regardless of their exact purpose, the protests would achieve the toppling of the Daladier government. And when Daladier resigned, he would be replaced by Gaston de Merge, who was still a member of the Radical Party, but one far more acceptable to those on the right. The most important outcome of these changes was actually not this new government but instead their reaction to the events on the French left. Up until 1934, the French socialists and communists were deeply divided, just like in most other countries. But the events of February 6th began to change this, and over the next several months, a unity would develop between the two groups. This would first manifest in a joint strike action that was staged on February 12th, then during the summer, they signed a unity pact. In October, they would then coordinate their electoral strategy to try and prevent one from stealing the seats from another. The final outcome of this cooperation would be the Popular Front government, which is where we will end this episode today. But first we have to focus on the whole spectrum of French politics, starting with the various right-wing groups that were involved in the February 6th movement. It would be their actions that would push the disparate groups on the left to create the Popular Front. Then, in the back half of this episode, we will discuss the formation of that Popular Front before we look at the actions of the Popular Front government after they came to power in June 1936, although that story will wait until next episode. On the surface level, French politics during the interwar years seems incredibly chaotic. The governments rarely lasted more than a year, and several only lasted a few months, or even a month. 
But underneath that chaos was a solid level of stability, as the governments mostly just cycled between the same groups over and over again. What this points to is that many of the groups in French politics largely agreed within with one another on many of the most important topics. This allowed the government creating majority, whatever it was, to continue to bounce just slightly around the center with largely the same group of supporters. Usually members of the radical party were at its core. On the right, there were groups of, of parties that would be categorized as conservative but in no way revolutionary. These groups had a broad base of support among French society, from the upper and middle classes, which were their core support group, but also among various groups of workers. During the 1920s, the majority were close to, or at least considered themselves, close to the center of French politics. Over the course of the interwar period, some of the parties would become more radical, the largest example being the Republican Federation Party, which, along with the Democratic Alliance, were the two largest parties on the right during the mid-1930s. The Republican Federation Party would be the bridge between the parties on the very far right, the the revolutionary-type parties, which chose a non-participatory course of action in official French politics, and the more mainstream political groups. There were some similarities between the shift in French politics and, and those that would occur in other nations. One of these was the growth in support for the left and the erosion of support for the right throughout the 1920s. In France, the elections directly after the war in 1919 would be the high watermark for the groups that would form the Bloc National, and they were able to ride the high of the victory. The post-war unity of these groups would erode in the following decade, as the port for the socialist and communist parties began to grow. One of the causes for this, but also one of the consequences of it, is that the parties on the right would fracture, with those closer to the center choosing a conciliatory path in collaboration with those on the center-left. This would set up the radical party into its very important position that would hold for multiple successive elections, allowing it to form multiple center-right or center-left governments. Meanwhile, those parties on the further right would start gaining more support, and they would be the groups that would welcome any person that did not support the left, This included ultra-nationalists, monarchists, religious groups, really anybody. On the furthest right were groups that would not even participate in normal politics, as discussed in the Dr. Chris Millington interview that was released a few weeks ago. They saw participation as an admission of legitimacy, and so they refused. There were several of these groups, and they all had different sets of beliefs and agendas. For example, Action Francaise would be a monarchist group for most of the interwar period, Whereas the other group, or another of the larger groups, the Croix de Four, would begin life as a veterans organization before morphing into fascism, or or at least a very fascist-adjacent sort of philosophy. Fascism in France is a bit of a topic for discussion. As we discussed during our episodes on the rise of Italian fascism, which which many fascists in France saw as an inspiration, or the rise of Nazism in Germany, Their blend of political ideas were often rooted in the identification and and vilification of an enemy. But France was in a different position due to the fact that it had just won a war and took care of many of its grievances with Germany in the process. It had got Alsace-Lorraine back. Or, as Eugene Weber would say in The Hollow Years, France in the 1930s, quote, Fascism had a low ceiling in France. It was a sated national. It had no territories to reclaim no oppressed major- minorities to redeem, no lost honor to reconquer, end quote. But that did not mean that nobody tried to create those types of fascist parties. There were several different groups modeled after Mussolini's fascists, often bankrolled by a few rich individuals who almost universally failed to gain too much traction. One of the problems would be Action Francaise, which was large enough to kind of suck the air out of the room on the French far right, making it difficult for other groups to grow beyond a certain size. And also, Action Francais was far too monarchist to really go down the fascist path. This would all somewhat change during the mid-1930s with the rising popularity of more radical right-wing groups, which Action Francais saw as a threat to their position. One of these groups, and the most frequently referenced as the leading fascist group in France, was the Cru de Fur. Here is Kevin Passmore from The Right in France from the Third Republic to Vichy. Quote, the Croix de Fur was the major beneficiary of a succession of failures of the center and right. 
The League combined attacks on state intervention in the economy with schemes for an authoritarian organization of the profession through which it mobilized groups that considered themselves, rightly or wrongly, unrepresented in parliamentary conservatism. End quote. The official statement of the party program, or at least the one that was published in October of 1933, seems less than radical. Typical conservative line items from this period are present, less taxation, fewer state monopolies, a reduction in nationalized industries. There was also strong corporatist support within the Croix de Fur, uh, which was one of the foundational principles of Italian fascism. Unstated within the program, but certainly a very real part of the group's belief system, was anti-Semitism. Other similarities with fascist groups in other nations were an inclination towards fashioning the party around paramilitary imagery and the presence of a constant struggle within the group's rhetoric. But I have to end the conversation on the Croix de Fur and the radical right in France with a disclaimer that whether or not these groups should be in the basket of other fascist groups is still open for debate. It really depends on who you talk to, with some claiming that they were simply authoritarian and nationalist and not fascist. My own opinion generally agrees with the fascist categorization, but I will qualify that categorization by stating quite clearly that that I take a very broad definition of fascism instead of the more exclusionary one that that you will get from some other sources. It's still, I think, kind of an open debate, so I'm not necessarily coming out here and telling you that someone is right or wrong. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end, or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. The Popular Front that would be created in the mid-1930s in France depended on two groups, the Socialists and the Communists. The French Communists represented the far right of politics in France during this period, and they also, for a good chunk of the interwar period, before 1934, refused to collaborate with others on the left due to their revolutionary beliefs. The split would begin in late 1920, and as is so often the case, would be in response to events in Russia. On December 29, 1920, the Tours Congress would take place, with one of the major topics of discussion being the 21 conditions that Lenin had placed on entry into the Third or Communist International. There were many at the Tours Conference that agreed with the conditions and wanted to join the International, but there was others who did not. This disagreement, which was fundamentally a disagreement about how influential international groups should be in charting the path of the French left, would cause the party split. The cause of this split is explained by Thomas Beaumont in International Communism and Interwar France, 1919-1936, like this. During his celebrated speech at Tours, in which he rejected membership of the Communist International and pledged to watch over the old house of French socialism, Leon Blum made clear his concerns that communists in France would serve as nothing more than Moscow's ciphers. 
Bloom attacked the Bolshevik tactic of revolution, criticizing Lenin's French enthusiasts for seeking to introduce dictatorial terror on the Russian model willy-nilly to France, and ended by underlining the communists' slavish, unquestioning obedience to Moscow, which distinguishes us, you from us, and always will. End quote. On one side would remain the French Section of International Workers, or the SFIO, which has a French name that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, which had been the French Socialist Party since its foundation in 1905. On the other side, and the one that agreed with the 21 conditions, was the French Section of the International Communists. Again, there's a French name that I'm not going to go for, or I will just call them the PCF. The split into two groups set up what would be the structure of the French left for the remainder of the interwar period. On the far left were the communists, then the socialists of the SFIO, and then the radicals. There were other smaller parties, but these were the three primary players. There would be many electoral coalitions between the socialists and the radicals, but there were constant problems in turning those coalitions into real politics. The radicals were themselves split and had many members who would not agree to changes that many socialists felt were essential. Then within the SFIO, there were also many differing opinions, and the disagreements between the various factions would cause many coalitions to collapse. Meanwhile, the PCF was a bit off in the wilderness. Then in 1927, the Communist International would push for a concerted policy of refusing to collaborate with other parties, which would be the path pursued by the communist parties all over the world, and in France this would last until 1934. While this would be one policy where the French communists would agree and go along with Russian policies, this would not always be the case. The relationship between the communist leaders in Russia and international communist groups in various nations is often simplified into one of leaders and followers, but as is usually the case, this is an oversimplification. Due to the long period that many communist leaders spent either in exile or at least in other foreign nations, the web of relations and connections was both dense and confusing. This would continue after events in Russia resulted in the formation of the Communist International. While the International, largely controlled by Russian leaders, could dictate changes, it also had to take into account a variety of local realities if it wanted to grow the support for communism in other nations. If those local conditions were not considered, support would be lost to other groups, and so many national communist parties were stuck in a constant balancing act of international and national concerns, including the French PCF. Events elsewhere around the globe would then also play into these calculations, like what would happen to the German Communist Party when the Nazi Party took power in 1933. Domestic events were also important, and in France, none would be more important than the events of February 6th, 1934. In the immediate aftermath of the 6th of February, the PCF and the SFIO called for demonstrations. These demonstrations were both protesting what had happened, but also were used as a form of organization and preparation just in case the worst were to happen, which in this case was a fascist coup. On February 9th, these demonstrations were led by the communists, and they would result in hundreds of people being injured or several ki and several killed. Then on February 12th, these, there would be a joint strike action between the communists and socialists. These strikes would also involve violence, but they were also able to show everyone in France the power of a unified left. Over a million workers would go on strike in Paris alone, and hundreds and thousands would join them in villages and cities all over the country. After over a decade of division, this brief period of joint action was a wake-up call to everyone. On the right, it revealed that perhaps they were not as strong in comparison as they believed, with both numerically and in unity. The incredible size and power of the strike dwarfed those from February 6th. Within the broad center of French politics, many just spoke out against the violence, joined by radical leaders who always pushed back against any violent protests. Then on the left, between the SFIO and the PCF, the results were seen as impressive, but did not in any way immediately heal the gaps and differences between the two groups. What it would do was lay the groundwork for growing unity that would take some serious strides over the course of the summer of 1934. In May, the French communist leader Therese would travel to Moscow, where in discussions with leaders there, the decision was made for united action in France, a policy that would then be announced in the French Communist Party conference in late June. During that conference, the party would propose and accept a conciliatory approach with the socialists, 
and negotiations would begin with the SFIO to make this a reality. During these negotiations, most of the discussion was around what needed to change in both groups for such a joint action to occur, mostly requiring both groups to stop openly insulting each other in public. The unity that this would spawn and would be made official in July was a path of common action against fascism. It did not mean that the groups were joining or that they agreed on all of their policies, but simply that they felt it was more important in the short term to work together against fascism. It was also the beginning of a relationship that would change and grow over the next two years. What would start as simply a less antagonistic relationship would develop into one where they would openly collaborate in November 1934 in a joint political program. The result was a program that was very moderate by communist standards, but was one clearly of compromise. Then in 1935, they would approach the radicals to create a popular front, which was just an agreement of the three parties to work together, with party autonomy retained and protected. During this time, the groups would also begin working together to assist each other at the electoral level. For example, the communists and socialists would agree to withdraw their candidates on second ballots of local elections in favor of the other, depending on who had the most support. How this worked in practice is that if in any local election there was no candidate that got above the threshold for the, somebody to win, the candidates with the lowest totals would drop out and another vote would occur. This would result in some pretty brutal vote splitting between similar parties like the SFIO and the PCF. So the agreement meant that in the second vote, either the SFIO or the PCF candidate with the lower total would drop out, moving all their votes to the other and making victory much more likely. While, the, while this new atmosphere of collaboration was spreading on the left, voters were also changing their preference. During the May 1936 elections, the vote share for those parties on the right dropped from 37.35 to 35.88%. Meanwhile, the support for the parties on the left rose by about 1.5%, up to 46%. Then within the left, the communist vote doubled from almost 7 to almost 12.5, while the radical vote fell from 15 to 11, with the socialists also dropping only very slightly. These numbers would set the stage for the creation of the Popular Front government in June 1936, under the leadership of Leon Blum, a government that would almost immediately experience turmoil, which we will discuss next episode. 